The trailers for both a Southern gangster drama and the next Pixar film make their way onto the internet as the coronavirus continues to have a devastating effect on the entertainment industry. I'm Joe Aserno. This is Real Talk. All right, so welcome back. Uh, anyone who is anyone who just happens to be turning on a screen of any kind, of course, knows about the effects the coronavirus is having pretty much everywhere. And, of course, the entertainment industry is no exception to that whatsoever. Um, there have been a few delays and or cancellations or pretty much just indefinite delays as far as certain big picture name, big name pictures that were supposed to come out within the next few weeks. Um, namely, A Quiet Place 2, which I'm not going to lie, I was kind of annoyed about. It was supposed to come out this coming Friday, and I was really looking forward to it. Finally, an amazing movie that would have come out in March. But, you know, it, it is what it is. I understand why they're, they're taking the precaution to push back film releases. They want to make sure that the effort that was put into all these films ends up being worth it in the end. Of course, they got to protect their pockets so that way they can keep making more films. So I totally understand why they're doing this. Other than A Quiet Place 2, Fast and Furious 9 got pushed back to next year. And as far as films that have just been delayed indefinitely are Mulan, The New Mutants, which I really feel bad for. This is, I forget now how many times that The New Mutants has been postponed, and this time it wasn't even their fault. So, of course, you have The New Mutants. I hope that this one ends up being a really solid movie with how much it's <laughs> it's gone through just in the build-up to its release, a really long build-up to its release. So maybe that that one will end up just being the little the little movie who could. And I guarantee you, with how many times it's been canceled, everyone's gonna flock <laughs> to see it. So, and I would I think that's gonna end up making its money back. And then of course you have the Lovebirds, that rom com starring Come On and Johnny and Issa Rae that was supposed to come out in the next few weeks weeks as well. I kept seeing the trailers for that with just about every movie that I went to go see. And yeah, you know, I guess it, it looked okay. Um, it was that would have been a movie that depending on my mood that particular day would have ruled how much I actually wanted to see it. And then, of course, you have Antlers getting pushed back as well, and definitely the new horror film from Scott Cooper, um, who was the director of films such as Crazy Heart, and Guillermo del Toro was a producing hand on that one, if I'm not mistaken. So that w that actually looked really interesting as well. So um, on top of a bunch of films just being pushed back or delayed indefinitely. A lot of big film events, you know, film festivals were either canceled or postponed as well. One of these events was, of course, the Tribeca Film Festival. And a film that a friend of mine worked on called Not Going Quietly was set to premiere at this particular film. The film follows an activist with ALS as he campaigns across the country for healthcare reform. It's a documentary. My friend Jordan Demento, shout out, um, <laughs> she she worked in the post-production team for the film, if I'm not mistaken. Jordan, of course, has done a lot of graphic design work for me as well. She's really saved my ass in that department because, you know, surprise, surprise, graphic design is not my strongest suit. So thank you, Jordan. And again, for um, as far as this film being postponed in its release, um, there is no new date set yet for that one. But the film is called Not Going Quietly. Keep your eyes peeled for it. Because it does have a very, very interesting topic, central idea going for it. So, on top of that, um, a lot of movie theater companies are adapting to everything with the coronavirus as well. You have AMC and Regal Cinemas capping, reducing the capacity of their theaters by about 50%. Um, they're, they're endorsing the idea of social distancing that's been seeming to go around. Um, and then I just noticed that just within the last week alone, my own tone has changed on this particular issue. I remember that, like, kind of last week, I was set on the idea that everything with the coronavirus was mostly hysteria, was at the very least 60 hysteria, 40 actually, 40 legitimate problem. Now, again, do I still believe that hysteria is contributing too much to everyone's anxieties right now? Absolutely. And again, I don't think the 24-hour news cycle is contributing to that, you know, that the 24 hour news cycle is always one of the things that my parents said that was one of the worst things to happen to this country because it's just constantly the same, you know, nerve wracking stuff just being thrown at you over and over and over again. And everything with the coronavirus and how they're handling this is, you know, no exception. So my suggestion to you, of course, it's important to watch when need be, 
you know, to stay updated on everything that's going on. But at the same time, in order to preserve your own sanity, limit how much you watch the news. Because then, of course, you know, they're not necessarily looking to just inform us, unfortunately. That's just how, you know, big journalism is nowadays. You know, they're looking for ratings and, you know, subscriptions and stuff like that. So if you want to have a better idea as to what is actually going on, you know, just look at scientists and <laughs> just just pay attention, pay more attention to them than reporters, reporters, because unfortunately they don't always have our best interests at heart every second of the day. So again, just keep having good habits, keep washing your hands, you know, sanitize when need be, but don't overdo it to yourself because the sanitizers, you know, of course kill the good germs in a way that we need our body to be exposed to in order to fight off the bad ones, or germs, bacteria, not whatever uh, term terminology is used when discussing this topic. And now, of course, that since there are a lot of films that are being delayed, there's not going to be so much for me to review on, on the show in, in the coming weeks. So I was thinking of ways to adapt to this somehow. And I, I came up with a couple ideas. Um, of course, when it comes to trailers being released online because the coronavirus hasn't canceled the internet yet. When it comes to trailers being released online, of course, I'm going to give my commentary on that. When it comes to just generally general movie industry news, just like before, I'm going to keep giving my thoughts on those as well. And now, instead of reviewing new films to fill that void, I was considering view, reviewing classic films. I'd pick a film each week, film or two each week, depending on how I'm feeling, depending on the theme that maybe I can associate with a particular week where I decide to watch a movie and just review a film, just review a classic film. Now, I know I wouldn't be the only one to be doing it, but I figured, you know what, it's still something to talk about. And I remember a few episodes ago, I did my top 10 films of the 2010s because, of course, we're just coming up. It's a 2020, new decade. I figured, you know what, let me reflect on the last decade. And I thought to myself after doing that segment, should I just keep counting back, you know, top 10 films of the 2000s, 1990s, 1980s? Etc. Etc. And I figured, you know what? Let me save those for when I really need it. And now I really need it. <laughs> so to cap off the episode today, I am going to be sharing my top ten films of the two thousands. And so you know what? That's just how I'm going to be doing things with this show, at least for the time being. We'll see what happens as far as you know the ever changing situation with the coronavirus. I was reading just today how they have more. They have a couple thousand labs access to labs that are going to be able to process the test for the coronavirus. I know at least 10 states have drive through um, self-tests for the coronavirus, so that can help with the quarantining effort, as, uh, so that way we can just, you know, stomp this out, at least for the time being. So, you know, I know a lot of people are on edge right now. I've become just a bit more on edge myself within the last week. and But it's uh, I know it's tough to keep your head up high, keep, keep your vision clear, amidst all the panicking and hysteria. But I remember that one line from The Dark Knight. The night is darker just before the dawn, and I promise you the dawn is coming. You know, whether we've reached the peak as far as how bad this whole thing is going to get, I really don't know. I think at least if China, where all this started, where they ha their health care is absolute garbage, even they're coming back up. Their numbers are getting better. So I think if they can do it, I think we'll just be, we'll be just fine in the end. You know, we're going to come out stronger than we did this, than we did before. And I remember my mom sharing a, I don't know, it was like a Facebook post with me or an article of some kind. I don't know. But it was a post of some kind. And the there is a medical professional writing about everything with the coronavirus and, like, you know, all the precautions to take and whatnot, and just laying out all the facts. And they kind of compared it to uh, the greatest generation basically buckled down and made sacrifices to contribute to the war effort, World War II. And while I'm never going to compare us just having to stay home for a few days to a full-on world war, I think basically what this particular author said was that they rose to the challenge to do what needed to be done for the greater good. And now I think this is our moment. This, is our, this might be our greatest generation moment because something like this with the coronavirus, everything that's going on, is allegedly something that's supposed to happen once in a generation, once in a century. So, this is our moment. Let's let's rise above ourselves. And uh, that's that's my final parting words for this <laughs> this pretty upbeat topic. So, moving on to an actual brighter note, the trailer for Arkansas was released on the internet this past week. 
It's a southern gangster drama. It follows two drug pushers working for an Arkansas kingpin they've never met, and they must run for their lives after a drug deal has gone horribly wrong. So just a few tidbits about this film. The film was directed, co-written, and co-produced by Clark Duke. For those of you who don't know who Clark Duke is, he was one of the um, newer um, office workers that came into the office right after Steve Carell left the show. And he was kind of like, you know, just kind of like nerdy, but the nerdy, geeky, but kind of kind of sleazy guy. And, and I, I think he was one of the reasons that the last couple episode, last couple seasons of The Office ended up being much better than they should have been after Steve Carell left the show. So, and I think that he's taking on as much as he has, you know, directing, writing, um, producing, and starring in the film as well. No, I think that says a lot. I think that's always a very impressive effort. Um, I think it's in, I think it says something to at least try and take that on. There's definitely a sense of ambition there, but at the same time, you know, you can't help but wonder like, oh, is this guy stretching himself too thin with all that he's taking on with this particular film? But hey, there's only one way to find out. Um, watching this trailer, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm, it's interesting. Um, it definitely looks, it looks like a, it looks like it, kind of like an interesting twist on the gangster drama because of course, when I think of gangsters and stuff like that, I think of like, you know, Italian mobsters or like, you know, drug dealers from Compton or whatever the case may be. Um, so, you know, having having this take place down in, down in the South, I think is an interesting idea. Now, is this going to be enough to separate it from other gangster dramas? I mean, who really knows? I mean, maybe a change of venue is all you need, but hey, I think, I don't know if a change of venue is enough to separate yourself from the rest of the competition, but hey, who knows? Because this film, of course, has a gritty, dark edge to it, but there's also something that feels very quirky about it, at least, again, based on the promotional trailer that was released a few days ago. So on top of that, you have... It, it does have a pretty solid cast. You got Liam Hemsworth, um, like I said before, Clark Duke, John Malkovich, who I'm, who I'm really a fan of, and then you have Vince Vaughn playing the kingpin who's going after the two main characters. And now I... I'm always kind of one. I'm always, I always kind of wonder how Vince Vaughn does in roles such as these when it comes to like you know this intimidating authority figure because I I first remember him from movies like Dodgeball, where exa- he wasn't, you know he wasn't the most intimidating guy in the world. And then I look at his role as the drill sergeant from Hacksaw Ridge, and he was actually really good. He was really really good. So based on at least that performance alone, I have faith in him to pull off the role as the as this ruthless kingpin in Arkansas but again is this going to be does he have what it takes to not only pull off the role but separate himself from other roles just like it this film is currently slated to be released in theaters on demand and stream online May 1st so <laughs> will the theater release actually happen who knows <laughs> who knows at this point but I think I think them streaming this online is probably the Safest bet for them right now to at least have people see the movie when they want them to see the movie. So May first, depending on where it's streaming, if I have a streaming service, I'm I'm gonna take the time to watch this one. It does it does look interesting, and I want to see exactly where this one goes. I want to see if Clark Duke ascends to more than just one of the geeky guys from The Office in its last two seasons. So moving forward, um, another trailer was released for the next Pixar film, Soul, and Soul follows a jazz musician's soul as he's it's thrown out of his body, and he must journey back to it with the help of an infant soul. So, this film is directed by Pete Docter, who is the same director as Inside Out and Up, two of the more famous Pixar films, which you know gives me some more confidence in this film. And there's a very, there's definitely a very imaginative quality that seems to be associated with this film. This idea of like, oh, you know, where do souls go exactly before, before you know coming to earth or then like you know of course getting out of earth so it's definitely got a very very unique feel to it um it's one of those films that i'm not exactly sure where exactly it could go it seems like this will be a film that's very hard to predict um and again there seems to be like a very immersive world and lore that is associated with this and I don't know if that's in large part because of the animation, because, of course, when it comes to the real-life aspects of the film, there's something that feels very realistic about it. I remember there's this one shot of the main character, the jazz musician Joe. He's just riding on a subway, 
and it's one of those elevated subways, and it's turn making the turn, and you see the logo facing the other way for Silver Cup Studios in Queens, and I thought that was a really cool touch. I didn't, that's not something I would have expected to see, something so close to reality, so close to home almost. So I thought that was a really cool quality about it. So there's, I guess there's a very unique and seemingly original feel to all this. And while I do feel that overall Pixar isn't exactly what they used to be, once every now and then there's a film that comes along from them that makes you think they could get themselves back to their glory days. Um, the last one that did this, I want to say, was... Uh, actually, you know, before, before Toy Story 4. And if we're going with just original ideas, because of, to of course Toy Story 4 is part of a long, long-standing franchi franchise... When it comes to original ideas, the last one that I feel like could get Pixar to his former glory was Inside Out, and it largely and it definitely succeeded in doing that. And I think Soul has the potential to do that based on just what we're seeing again, just from its originality, just from who they have as far as pedigree going into this film. Like I said, Pete Docter is leading the charge on this one, who is made two of the best Pixar films, at least in my memory. You have the voice talent from of course Jamie Foxx and Tina Fey. Tina Fey whom I absolutely adore. I love Tina Fey so much. Um, she plays the infant soul that's supposed to help Jamie Foxx or Joe Soul on his journey. And then uh, just a little note here you have Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross working on the score from this for this film with Jonathan Bastille but I Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross took my attention even more because they also did the score for The Social Network, which is a terrific score, won them the Academy Award over Inception somehow, but it's still a terrific score. And then they also did the score for Gone Girl, which is another terrific musical score. So I'm I'm very confident in this one. Now, as far as what has me worry with the film itself, I can't say there's really much. This looks like a pretty solid bet. The only thing I am worried about is, again, how long is this coronavirus thing going to last for? It, because this film is currently slated to be released in June of this year. But it seems like just with every other <laughs> film release that's been coming up, that seems to be subject to change. So that's that's my only concern. Because if this one gets pushed back, I, I'm going to be a little annoyed. Because this one does look really, really good. I'm very, very excited for this one. Okay, and to cap off this particular episode, again, in... <laughs> In adjusting to everything with the coronavirus, I'm going to give my top 10 films of the 2000s. Now, this is a pretty big decade for movies. Um, this is the decade where Pixar Animation Studios came into its own as a giant in animation, as where traditional Disney animated films, the traditional Disney animated studio, kind of kind of took a backseat for the most part. So Pixar definitely reigned supreme over them. Of course, you had DreamWorks coming up with a lot of their films, Shrek, you know, Kung Fu Panda, etc., etc. Um, a lot of infamous or famous film trilogies made themselves known here. This is where the MCU got set started in this particular decade with Iron Man. You have the Harry Potter series, which is a you know staple in my house. Love the Harry Potter movies. They're all consistent, even though some are better than others. Consistently, they're very very solid movies. Then of course you have the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which again is gonna is a cinematic landmark, and I'm probably gonna get into that. Just a bit later, hint, hint. All right, so I'm going to give my honorable mentions first, and they are Inglorious Bastards, Ratatouille, There Will Be Blood, City of God, Finding Nemo, The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, and A Beautiful Mind. All right, now starting off the list at number 10 from 2006 is Pan's Labyrinth. In Phalange, Spain in the 1940s, a young girl whose stepfather is a brutal military captain finds a portal into a mysterious fantasy world. The film is directed and written by the one and only Guillermo del Toro, and it stars Ivana Baquero, Maribel Verdú, Doug Jones, Adriana Gill, and Sergio Lopez. I hope I said all those names correctly. <laughs> now, in my opinion, this is Guillermo del Toro's best film. This is a film that, when it comes to his style of filmmaking, that I associate with him the most. To me, this is the most Guillermo del Toro film. And I'm not just saying that because it's the best. It's the film that feels the most like him. Um, the film is, of course, you know, terrifying and gruesome. There's this one there's this one scene where there's the girl has gone into the fantasy world and she finds she stumbles upon this monster with like, like you know, has to put his eyes into his hands in order to see if if anyone's remember that scene. And I just remember that monster like just like biting off the heads 
of like the pixies that were assigned to try and protect the girl. Oh, oh my god, that 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 fucked me up the, <laughs> the first time I saw that. So there's this intoxicating sense of despair that's associated with the film, and it blends perfectly with this sense of wonder in the fantasy elements that I think Guillermo del Toro has become known for. Um, of course, it, there's a very the film, of course, is very imaginative. Even though, even though it is essentially Alice in Wonderland for adults, it's there's something that feels very imaginative about it all. And again, I think that is because of the sense of despair, the sense of terror that is injected into this fantasy world. That, of course, you didn't get with Alice in Wonderland. Like, yeah, I'm sure if you look, there's some scary parts here and there, but it was it was nothing like this. It's nothing like this. And and of course, it's just very well done on all fronts visually. There's something very... It's very weird. In terms of the visuals, I don't know if there's something that seems like kind of low-budget about it, but I, I don't think low-budget's the right word. But there's just something that seems very unique about it all. There's a kind of flair that it has to it that just doesn't seem like anything I've seen in a lot of other films. And again, I think that is in part because of the touch of Guillermo del Toro. And, you know, the performances all around are pretty solid, but there's the one standout performance in this entire film from Sergi Lopez as the brutal military captain, Captain Vidal. And he's probably the scariest monster in this entire movie. And I'm sure that was intentional, but he is absolutely terrific in this film. He is terrifying every time he walks onto the screen. I think in particular, he was robbed of an Oscar nomination this particular year. And I think the film was robbed of nominations for Best Picture and Best Director. So Pan's Labyrinth is in my mind, one of the films that establishes Guillermo del Toro as an auteur. So, moving on to number nine from 2009 is The Hurt Locker, and the film follows an army bomb squad's last days of their tour in the Iraq War as they clash with a newly assigned, reckless, but brilliant sergeant. The film was directed by Catherine Bigelow, ex-wife of James Cameron, and I'll get into that just a bit more in a second. Directed by Catherine Bigelow, written by Mark Bull, and stars Jeremy Renner, Anthony Mackie, and Brian Garrity. Now, this film has, is a very intense interpretation and intense and realistic interpretation of the Iraq War. There's a very timely feel to it all. And again, this film, of course, doesn't necessarily take a, at least in my memory, doesn't take a position on the Iraq War itself. It's not political like that, but it's at the same time, it's very, it's very timely because it, the film did come out just a few years after the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And... You know, it kind of it's the kind of film that makes you feel like you're on the battlefield itself. There's just nothing that feels like it's blown out of proportion because, like, it's it's very weird. There's nothing in this film that feels like embellished for a cinematic effect, but at the same time, with the intensity and realism that's put into this film to pull you into the world that these army men have to battle every single day, it ends up being very cinematic, and it st still ends up being very immersive. It's a very it's a very well done film, masterfully executed. Catherine, this is this is the only film I've seen from Catherine Bigelow, but this is the film that I now look. Anytime I hear about her making another movie, I'm seeing myself like, okay, this this could be something great. This uh, this is something that could possibly be looked forward to, that that I could possibly look forward to. It's something that I could put on my radar. Um, the on the technical front, this film was just absolutely outstanding from the sound to. The action, but at the same time, on top of all that, there are a lot of personal moments that stood with me more than anything. There's this one scene with Anthony Mackie's character about, you know, he's kind of just telling about his life back home, and he kind of just breaks down in tears. He's just like, you know, I want my son. I want my son. And, you know, that's, that, I don't know, that was, that was pretty powerful to me, because throughout the film, he's kind of played as this guy who's, like, really just fed up with the <laughs> with all the shit that, you know, Jeremy Renner's character does. And, you know, it's it's it was kind of surprising, but at the same time kind of moving to see this more sensitive side of this, you know, no nuts in sky. But again, that I think a lot of the effect that that brings ties into the performances as well across the board, but especially from Jeremy Renner and Anthony Mackie. I think Mackie in particular was robbed of an Oscar nomination. Jeremy Renner was nominated, and rightfully so. And then, of course, it won... Six Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Director, oh, for went to Catherine Bigelow. She was the first woman in Oscar history to win Best Director. And one of the things that I think is just really funny <laughs> about this is that, of course, she was married to James Cameron. And James Cameron was, of course, nominated for Best Director for Avatar that same year. And 
And obviously, the, even though the two are on good terms, they are friends now. Um, you know, they're married for a while, and uh, one ex, one over the other, <laughs> which you know, I think that's always a uh, that's always a funny story. <laughs> but you know, I I remember when that film first won. I remember hearing people talking like, you know, oh, you know, this film should have won over that, like, you know, Inglorious Bastards or Avatar. And as great as those movies are, I remember thinking to myself like. Have you guys ever watched The Hurt Locker? It's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's actually a really, really great movie. All right, coming in at number eight from 2004 is Million Dollar Baby. And the film is about a jaded boxing coach as he trains a spirited young woman to become a professional boxer herself. The film was directed by Clint Eastwood, based on the book Rope Burns by FX Tool, adapted for the screen by Paul Haggis. And the film stars Clint Eastwood, Hilary Swank, Morgan Freeman, Jay Baruchel, Anthony Mackie, Michael Pena, and Martin, Mar or excuse me, Margot Martindale. Now, this is the film that opened up Clint Eastwood to me as a filmmaker. I saw the, I saw the role or roles that he took on this film, and just how well that he pulled off every single role that he took on. You know, he's stars in the film, and it's definitely one of the best performances I've ever seen from him. And even then, this overall, this is my favorite film from him. This is the film I, I saw this film, and it just had a very assured hand on the directing end because there's a lot of emotion that the film wrestles with and there are some points that are like very tough for it to that are kind of tough to sit through because there's some like you know really dramatic and like you know harsh stuff in there but at the same time the film also has a great sense of humor and I think to for those aspects of the film to mesh as perfectly as they do I think is in large part due to the direction of Clint Eastwood um and then again just across the board um Performances are terrific all around. Um, Hilary Swank and Morgan Freeman won Oscars for their work. Um, Clint Eastwood was nominated for Best Actor, but he ended up winning Best Director and Best Picture because he was one of the producers on the film. But I look at his win for Best Director, and this win made him the oldest Oscar winner for Best Director. And I look at that kind of talent that he had at that age, and you would think after that point that he would slow down. Because I, I believe he was either 74 or 76 when he won for this film. But no, he didn't. He went on to make Letters of Iwo Jima. And, uh, you know, he's had, you know, before I go on to all the good stuff that he's done, he's had a couple flops here and there that didn't do so well. Um, 1517 to Paris didn't do so hot. Um, I think there was another film called Hereafter that's kind of, you know, slipped through the cracks. But, you know, he's had a lot of other, you know, he's had a lot of other successes. Like I said, he went on to make Letters of Iwo Jima. Um, American Sniper is a great movie, minus the, you know, whole fake baby scene. Sully was a solid movie. If you haven't seen Richard Jewell, I reviewed it on the first episode of the show, and that was another great movie as well. So I think it just goes to show that someone like Clint Eastwood, who is in his upper 80s at this point, I think he's going to be 90 this year, and he's still making... Not only, he's not only is he just making films in general, but he's making the quality films that he's making and has been making as someone who is kind of on the, on the back nine of his career. You know, I think that I think that says a lot about him. So, props to props to Clint Eastwood because like he's he's obviously an, he's an American icon. So, and I think he's well well deserved that status. It's not just not just hype with him. All right, docking in at number seven for all the way from two thousand eight, we have The Dark Knight. Of course, the Probably the most famous installment in the Batman franchise. This follows the Cape Crusader as he's given his most intense emotional and mental test as he battles the chaotic anarchist known only as the Joker. The film was directed by Christopher Nolan with the screenplay by Nolan, his brother Jonathan, and David G. Sawyer. And it is based on the comic book characters created by Bob Kane. The film stars Christian Bell as Batman along with Gary Oldman, Aaron Eckhart, Michael Kane, Maggie Gyllenhaal, Morgan Freeman, and of course... Heath Ledger and his iconic portrayal as the Joker. Now, of course, for the longest time, at least in my mind, until Joker came along, this is the greatest comic book film of all time. Now, I think the two are in, at least in the same league with each other as far as, like, which one's better. You know, I'm sure when I go back and watch each each particular film, you know, my opinions are, are going to change. I'll think, okay, Dark Knight's better on this day. Oh, no, Joker's better on this day, and so on and so forth. But I think the thing that's so intriguing about The Dark Knight is that it not only works as just like, you know, a, an amazing comic book film, it's also a really thrilling and complex crime saga. You know, in terms of like how the story is told, it's very, it's just all around thrilling, it's very twisty, 
And there's a powerful morality that's associated with this. And I think, you know, that's all summed up in the line from Harvey Dent. I think Harvey Dent, next to the Joker, is probably given, like, a lot of the best lines in this entire movie. <laughs> um, I, he basically turns around and says, like, you know, in talking about the, the, the crime situation in Gotham and how bad it's getting, he basically says, you know, you live, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Obviously, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know that line. But I think that one line basically sums up the entire film. You know, and especially with his character as well. Um, again, there's so much that's just legendary about this movie. And over a decade later, it's still, you know, I've lost kind of how many memes <laughs> have been made based on shots and scenes and clips from this movie. Um, of course, you have the dialogue based just about everything the Joker says um, is, you know, Martian to legendhood. Um, the music, I easily, among Hans Zimmer's best scores, even though he worked on this with James Newton Howard, um, how this film wasn't nominated for original score and a bunch of other awards. Um, that particular year, I have no idea. I think, honestly, it's because the Academy was reluctant to nominate something of the comic book genre, but I think they've gotten over that since Joker not only won two Oscars this year, but also was nominated for 11. And I think The Dark Knight helped push a lot of ground forward because it itself didn't end up getting eight nominations, which is a lot. Most of them were in technical categories, and Heath Ledger and the sound editing um, squad ended up taking home wins. Heath Ledger's win was a posthumous, posthumous win. He unfortunately died right before the film's release. But, of course, this is a legendary performance from him. As far as whose performance is better as the Joker, Heath Ledger, or Joaquin Phoenix, you know, it's that's a tough match. You know, it all depends on how you look at it. And for me personally, it depends on the day. There's just something about this entire film that feels like it's going to stand the test of time for a long time because it already has for, like I said, over a decade. So this is a film that I think really launched Christopher Nolan into the forefront as a highly competent filmmaker. And I think this film really paved the way for a lot of the other films that Christopher Nolan did and was able to get the support and backing to do, such as Inception, such as, you know, Interstellar, Dunkirk, now coming out this summer, hopefully this summer, um, Tenet. And I think a lot of this did start with The Dark Knight. Because, of course, he had a couple hits before. You know, he had Batman Begins. He had Memento, which are solid films as well. But I think Dark, The Dark Knight is probably the biggest leap forward for him, and that's basically what's helped him turn into the filmmaker, the well-regarded filmmaker that he is today. Now, coming up at number six from 2003 is the finale to the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, and it follows Aragorn and Gandalf as a conquest with the armies of men against Sauron to distract him from Frodo and Sam, who are carrying the Ring of Power to the fires of Mount Doom. The film was directed by Peter Jackson, adapted by Jackson, his wife, Fran Walsh, and Philippa Boyens, from the novel, classic novel, um, The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien. And the film stars Elijah Wood, Viggo Mortensen, Ian McKellen, Sean Astin, Orlando Bloom, John Rice davies and I could go on and on and on. And of course, who could forget Andy Serkis as Smeagol slash Gollum. Now, this is, of course, the, the most that I can say about this movie, on top of the five times that everyone thought that this movie was going to end, this is, of course, an epic conclusion to an already epic trilogy. Um... I don't think the first two films would have been as impactful if they didn't stick the landing as well as they did with this final film. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the emotion that's put into this film. And it's in this film that I realized that this is where, this is what makes this entire trilogy worth it. You know, the, all the, like I said, the character dynamics and everything, like all the relationships that are now put to the test after all these films. And I think that is basically summarized in the scene where Frodo and Sam are so they're climbing they're literally climbing up Mount Doom. And Frodo from he's so drained from having to carry the ring for as long as he's had to carry it, and he just can't even walk. And this is when Sam turns to him and goes, you know, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. Now come on. And he picks him up and he climbs and he just keeps on climbing up. You know, they have the music swelling up and oh, it's just perfect. And this is and, and it's moments like these that I think solidified the trilogy's status as a landmark cinematic achievement. Like, this is... When I look back at all three of these movies, I, I think this is why it's very important to have a very consistent vision when you're doing a multi-film series because it's, it's obvious from the beginning that Peter Jackson was in love with this trilogy. So like I said, this is a 
like I said, landmark cinematic achievement, just as the trilogy itself, you know, won 11 Oscars. It tied the record for most Oscar wins with both Ben-Hur and Titanic. And so this, this is my number six pick. All right, coming in at number five, all the way from the beginning of the decade, is Gladiator. Gladiator follows a Roman general who is betrayed by a corrupt emperor and carries out his revenge on said emperor after he orders the murder of his family and forces him into slavery. The film was directed by Ridley Scott, written by David Franzoni, John Logan, and William Nicholson, and stars Russell Crowe, Joaquin Phoenix, Oliver Reed, Richard Harris, Connie Nielsen, Derek Jacoby, and Jimon Hunsu. Now, for this film's entire 155-minute runtime, it manages to be a lot of things in one. It's both a compelling political drama, it's a comp- compelling revenge drama, it's a compelling, you know, action drama. There's a lot of large-scale, gripping action that's associated with this film. On top of that, you have, of course, you know, Russell Crowe and Joaquin Phoenix giving terrific turns in not only just this particular film, but the performances in this film, I think, are among the best in both of their careers. This is among their more iconic roles. Um, like I said before, the action is just absolutely captivating. Um, the artistic design, like, this is one of those movies that I look into, you know, the sets and costumes, and I thought to myself, wow, that must have been a pain in the ass to do. <laughs> but it, they obviously pulled it off. And, and so it, I guess it just must have been worth it. And then, you know, of course, to round things off, you do have, you know, a terrific musical score from Hans Zimmer, and I believe Lisa Gerard helped him out on this as well. But again, this is, seems to be more associated with the work of Hans Zimmer. And of course, this is among his better works, nominated for the Oscar, and somehow lost. Again, seems to be a trend with Hans Zimmer. He's only won once before. He's had so many nominations he should have more wins than he's actually gotten but again that's just in in my humble opinion and so it in my mind too this is the best film of Ridley Scott's career as much as I love films like you know The Martian there's just a sense of grandiose that is found in this movie that feels like a Ridley Scott film but at the same time there's a, there's a grander sense in this film than I found in a lot of his other films. Not that his other films are necessarily bad. A lot of his other films that are really great, like I said, The Martian, American Gangster is another great one. But, you know, Gladiator is the crowning achievement of his filmography. Oh, and don't forget Thelma and Louise too, but still, Gladiator. <laughs> Gladiator is still definitely, like I said, it's it's the best of his career. Number four, all the way from 2004, is The Aviator. The Aviator is the life story of filmmaker and aviator Howard Hughes, as he rises to and falls from eccentric aristocrat to reclusive madman. The film is directed by Martin Scorsese, written by John Logan, and stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Blanchett, John C. Riley, Kate Beckinsale, Alec Baldwin, Ian Holm, Danny Houston, and Alan Alda. Now, on the surface of this film, you might get the impression that it's just like, you know, pretentious and even boring Oscar bait because it's a nearly three-hour film about one man's life story, about, or... Really, it's, it's a three-hour biopic. And usually, you know, biopics are prime Oscar bait. You know, they're among the easiest way to at least be contenders for the Academy Award, even if your film isn't all that great. That's not the case with this one. Not even close. Um, now, one of the things that is that stands out so much about this film in particular is that it works as not only an engaging character study, but it's, a, it's also a really exquisite period piece. You know, the sets, the costume design are all amazing. Um, the cinematography from Robert Richardson, I I know that, or at least I remember reading somewhere, that they tried to, in a way, I don't know if mimic's the right word, but they try to, they try to sh- colorize the film as films from that particular decade that the film takes place in would be colorized, if that makes sense. Um, so... And again, there's like a sort of, I don't know if saturated is the right word, but the colors very much pop off the screen in this particular film. Which, again, not that that's not common for a Martin Scorsese film, but I just thought like with what they tried to do, I just thought it was very interesting. Um, And looking at the content of this film, the story of this film, and even how Scorsese goes about making this film, he's definitely being very much outside of his comfort zone. Um, this definitely feels like his most unique film, the film that feels the least like his other films, and it seems like he very much rises to the task. He's very comfortable in putting this one together. Um, I just look at like you know the hand that he had, and like and how this is one of those films that's just firing on 
all cyl cylinders. Um, it, I think one of the things that helps the film feel less of a burden as far as its runtime is the editing. You know, the editing, of course, is razor sharp. It's very brisk. I remember there's this one scene in particular where Howard Hughes, who has, like, a, a lot of, like, you know, social anxieties, I guess is the best way to put it. He doesn't necessarily do so well in crowds. Um, he's walking through the red carpet at the premiere of one of his films. I think it was, you know, Hell's Angels at this point. And, you know, there's, like, a whole bunch of, like, you know, flashing cameras and flashing lights, and it's obviously, like, you know, bothering him, but just, like, you know, how much, you know, they're cutting between, like, the flashing and, like, you know, his reactions and all that. Oh, it's just absolutely perfect. Like, that's that's a master class in editing alone. Um, and then, of course, this film would be nothing about, like, you know, the without the performances. It's a terrific cast. Um, Kate Blanchett as Catherine Hepburn is terrific. Um, Alan Alda is a great antagonist. He comes in um, towards the later end of the film. But this film would be nothing, absolutely nothing, without DiCaprio as Howard Hughes himself. He is the anchor for this film. He is absolutely amazing. He was nominated and lost to Jamie Foxx for Ray. I think, honestly, if it were up to me, I would have given it to DiCaprio that particular year. But what he brings to the screen, this is definitely one of his standout performances, in my opinion. It, it's quite possibly his favorite performance, or my favorite performance of his, next to maybe Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and The Wolf of Wall Street. So, The Aviator, it's definitely, I think, one of the films that Martin Scorsese says he isn't as known for. Which is interesting because I really feel like he should be more known for this film. Number three, again from the same year as The Aviator, is The Incredibles. The Incredibles is a Disney Pixar film that follows a retired domesticated superhero who's called back into action to combat a mysterious affluent weapons manufacturer. The film was directed and written by Brad Bird and features the voice work of Craig T. Nelson, Helen Hunt, Samuel L. Jackson, and Jason Lee. Now, this film is... A, a film in the Pixar pantheon that, again, in my mind, separates itself from the rest of the competition. You know, there's something that feels more mature about it all, but at the same time, it's still very gripping, still very funny, um, pays a lot of certain, like, you know, homages to, like, the campy superhero um, franchises of the past, but at the same time, it's still very serious and stylish and smart where it needs to be. And that's the overall feeling, that's the underlying feeling of this film in particular. Now, this is one of those films where years later, I still pick up on things here and there. I remember, of course, seeing the film in theaters when I was about seven. And, you know, of course, I thought it was great. It was awesome. But then I remember watching it in my um, digital imaging class in high school. I don't know if my teacher was out that day or if it was just the end of the year. And it was just at the point where, you know, no one really gave a shit about anything. So we were just watching movies. But we happened to be watching The Incredibles. And I'm watching this. And there's still a lot of things that I'm picking up on. Like, for example, the island that Mr. Incredible co goes to is called No Manison Island, which, if you space it out, is, you know, No Manison Island, which is perfect because throughout the entire film, Mr. Incredible is always saying, like, you know, oh, I work alone, oh, I got to do this myself. You know, he's reluctant to rely on other people, other heroes to help him do his work when he really needs to. And I put that together. I'm like, oh, my God, that's just that's just brilliant. <laughs> that's there's I think brilliant is probably if I had to sum up this one this movie with just one word brilliant would be it this would this is the film that at least for me made brad bird my favorite leading creative voice from pixar because of course you have him you have pete doctor you have you know john lasseter who did toy story and, and cars but i think brad bird there's just something that he brings to the table that differentiates himself from the other voices at pixar and the last one of the last things that really stands out for me are the themes of individuality and how then at least for me that that speaks very personal that that's it's a very personal theme for me you know this idea of just you know kind of being able to express who you are and, be, and not only express who you are but be proud of who you are and again that's very much underlined in the fact that the superheroes have to hide who they are from modern society because of course there comes a point in the film where superheroes are kind of like you know outlawed and and banned and everything and there are certain people in um mr incredible's family that are more proud of their superpowers and there are others who aren't um the musical score is amazing i look at the animation which is absolutely spectacular and especially the sound design this movie won i believe best sound editing at the academy awards and i think just for the scene alone where dash is running on water 
come on. That's just, that's just nuts. That was, ugh. But, again, this is definitely, it, this is my favorite Pixar film. I know a lot of people would usually say, like, you know, Toy Story or Up, but no, I gotta go with The Incredibles. All right, coming up as the runner-up from 2006 is The Departed. The Departed follows moles inside both the Massachusetts State Police and Irish Mafia as they struggle to find each other out in modern-day Boston. The film is directed by Martin Scorsese, is adapted by William Monaghan from the film Infernal Affairs that was written by Felix Chung and Alan Mack. And it stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson, Mark Wahlberg, Alec Baldwin, Vera Farmiga, and Martin Sheen. Now, this film is a very unexpectedly funny film. There are, it's one of, and one of the things that I love is when a more dramatic film finds a lot of ways to be funny, even though like that's not the main focus. It's kind of like a side gig for it. And there are a lot of like really funny moments in this entire film. But of course, for every funny moment, there's at least three engrossingly dramatic moments throughout the duration of this film, which is, I believe is about two and a half hours long. Um, like most other Martin Scorsese movies, it's very gritty. It's, you know, it's very gruesome, but at least to accompany all that, it's got a very complex narrative with a lot of moving story parts to it. Um, the characters, there are a lot of characters in this movie and they all feel very fully formed. They all feel very layered. They've got like their own personalities and, you know, backstories and motivations that all shine through without feeling like, you know, it's forced without feeling like, you know, you got to write like just a bunch of different scenes in order to, you know, make that part of the character shine through. Um, the dialogue, a lot of great, you know, very sharp. Um, incredible, in terms of the cast, it, you, they've obviously assembled a, a terrific cast and all of them deliver, but in particular, the standouts are DiCaprio and Jack Nicholson. Um, how the two were nominated for the Academy Awards for that particular year, I have no idea whatsoever. Um, even on a musical front, um, the score is terrific. But even the soundtrack, there's a, there are a lot of pop song, pop culture songs in here. And this is the film that actually introduced me to both Dropkick Murphys and Van Morrison. So thank you, Martin Scorsese, for, for that one. Um, even on a technical front, the editing is terrific. And just this is the film that won Martin Scorsese his first Oscar. You know, he'd been, at least at this point, he'd been in the business for 30 plus years. I don't know how this was his first win, especially when he had films like Raging Bull, like Goodfellas come out way before. Um, so I think at least if he had to get his first win, then I think this is one of the best ways that he could get his first win. Because he's even said too, like, you know, if I'd won my Oscar before then, then that would have affected the way that I make movies. And looking back, I don't want anything to change <laughs> about the way that Martin Scorsese has made movies. He's my favorite director of all time, as I'm sure I've mentioned on this show before. So... The Departed is one of those movies that I like watching over and over and over again. I first watched it when I was 15. And while I was still, of course, entertained by it, still captivated by it, this is another one of those films where as I get older and watch it more, there are certain things that I appreciate a bit more. There are certain things that I catch on to that maybe I didn't when I was younger. And even though this isn't like one of those, like, you know, high, I don't know if I'd say like high level, high concept movies. It's not like, you know, Inception where it deals with a lot of like, you know, heady concepts or Interstellar. There's still something that feels very smart about this movie, about The Departed. And finally, at long last, to conclude this gargantuan list, um, <laughs> I didn't. I obviously didn't realize what I was getting myself into when I decided to talk about all the movies that I loved from this particular decade. My number one film of the 2000s is The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, all the way from 2001, towards the beginning of, that, of this particular decade. Now, I know what you're thinking. I already included a Lord of the Rings film on this list. Why would you include more than one film for one for just one list? And honestly, it's because this film speaks to me more. It speaks to me in different ways than The Return of the King did. Um, so basically, The Lord of the Rings is the start of it all. Um, follows Frodo from the Shire as he sets up with, at this point, eight other companions on a journey to vanquish the One Ring to rule them all. As per usual, directed by Peter Jackson... Scripted by Jackson, his wife, Bran Walsh, and Philippa Boyens, and it was based on the original novel by J.R.R. Tolkien. And much of the same cast from The Return of the King is in this film as well, with you know very little exceptions here and there. Now, this movie, at least for me, set the bar for fantasy films. This is the movie that, just because a movie is of the sci-fi or fantasy, fantasy genre, doesn't mean that you can't 
achieve something that's just very, very cinematic out of all, out of it all. And I think that for a long time, there was this sort of connotation with sci-fi and fantasy, with particularly fantasy, that you can only get like, you know, campy, B-movie grade stuff with like, you know, like cheesy special effects or hell, maybe even get great special effects. But like, you know, the storytelling just isn't all there. That's not the case with this one. When I say this set the bar, this is the movie that gets everything right, at least in my opinion, for fantasy cinema. Um, it's the It was an epic start to this epic trilogy. And it, even though this film ends like, you know, like one part of the story has been done, like the story has been done, it still, you want, it still left you wanting more. It still said that like, okay, there's still more that, you know, needs to be done that, you know, these characters have to go through. But at the same time, we're satisfied where it ends off for now. You know, and I think a lot of that, I think oh, the biggest thing of what makes this movie so strong is not only the special effects that I think were ahead of its time, where, of course, the like I said, with the Return of the King, the character dynamics, you know, the relationships between these, you know, eight men who are, you know, looking out for each other, especially with the relationship between Sam and Frodo, who are obviously the closest of them all, with the, even just the little things that I noticed, too. Um, with, with Boromir, even though he, when he redeems himself in the end, like, you know, he's worried about whether or not some of the other hobbits have been taken by the orcs who have just raided them. He's just like, oh, you know, what about the little ones? And even just when in the middle of the film where, you know, they're, they're on their journey, they're on their quest already. And, you know, Boromir is just teaching them how to fight, how to, you know, how to, you know, wield swords and whatnot and fight with them. And uh, it's, it's, like I said, little things like that, that I wouldn't expect to notice that I wouldn't expect to, you know, ring so strong. And then, of course, you have um, Frodo looking up to Gandalf as much as he does. And when, you know, Gandalf, unfortunately, is dragged into dragged from the bridge of Casa Doom by the Balrog, you know, that's a very powerful scene. That's an emotional scene. <laughs> and there's another one of those things where, like, again, in a fantasy movie, at least at face value, I wouldn't expect something like this to hit as much as it does at least looking at fantasy films before and then coming into this you're like wow okay the this kind of movie can do that too um just even the minds of moria sequence is probably the most more memorable sequence most you know most memorable part of the entire film trilogy it's easily one of my favorite film sequences that i've ever seen you know you have this you know epic thrilling action carrying the characters throughout the scene. The music is just... And by the way, the music in this movie is absolutely phenomenal. This is one of the best musical scores I've ever seen for a film. I remember doing some research, and, you know, this is before I'd seen any of the Lord of the Rings movies. And, of course, as you know, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. I look at the category of best original score and, like, all the winners and nominees. You know, I'm such a huge dork when it comes to that. And I see that Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, won, again, another very iconic score was nominated but lost that year. And I'm like, what the hell? How could this one possibly lose? And then, you know, I saw that, you know, lost to the Fellowship of the Ring. I'm like, the Fellowship of the Ring? Like, okay, fine, whatever. Then I watched the Fellowship of the Ring. And I realized, like, okay, you know what? Any other year, Harry Potter probably would have won. Not the case here. (laughs) Not the case here. You know, this is obviously a very well-deserved win for a composer, Howard Shore. Um, But again, like I said, it's a movie that's just firing from all fronts. The amount of care the amount of attention to detail that's put in this film shows just how in love that that peter jackson was with this entire trilogy from the very beginning and it's obviously like i said with the return of the king that he never lost that love and this is one of those movies that i can't imagine anyone else doing that this is the film for me that defines peter jackson as a filmmaker of course i think the entire lord of the rings trilogy does that for him though again as with the return of the king the trilogy wouldn't have been what it was if peter jackson had not set out the course so well for the trilogy with the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, again, his performances all around are terrific. Um, Ian McKellen gives, obviously, the most memorable one. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Should have won that year. Iconic character portrayal. Obviously, very convincing, um, very gripping performance. He should have won, period. You know, this is one of those movies that, you know, is important to me, is so important to me, and has kind of, influenced me it was was one of the movies that made really made me want to go into filmmaking this is one of those movies that made me realize what exactly movies can do 
for its audience. I, I'll never forget. I think it was in the 10th grade. You know, I just got my heart broken by someone that, by a girl that I liked for a really long time, like two and a half years. You know, and I finally, finally got turned down by her. And, you know, I was, this was like the first like real, really brutal, I'm not going to say brutal rejection because she was very sweet about it, but this was the first, <laughs> this was the first rejection that really hit me really hard. You know, it left a pretty lasting effect on me for a while because of course it was my first one. And I remember going home early that day because, like, you know, just, like, you know, I was really upset. And I wanted to watch a movie to make myself feel better. And I picked The Fellowship of the Ring. And, you know, as soon as I was done with it, I was elevated. And I think that's in, you know, I think that just says a lot about the film. And there's this one line in the film that spoke so much to me and I think was a big reason as to why, like, you know, my mood just got elevated just a bit more that day. But there's this one line in the movie that, of course, is in the book as well. And it's when Gandalf says to Frodo, when Frodo's deciding, like, you know, should he go on without his companions who have left to fight the orcs? You know, he's basically thinking to himself, like, you know, oh, I, I wish this never happened to me. I wish I never got, like, you know, the one ring. I wish I was never the one to, you know, bring the ring to Mount Doom. And then this is when he hears a voice from Gandalf saying, so do all who live to such times, but it's not for them to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. Obviously, this is my favorite movie quote of all time. and ended up being my high school yearbook quote. So, so important to me. And I think that was just the icing on the cake as to the impact that this film in particular has had on the way I look at movies and just on my life in general. I know it sounds like you know, a bit cliche and corny to say that, like, you know, oh, this movie speaks so much to me, but it does. It's this grand sense of adventure and, you know, a tale of brotherhood all in one. And, you know, I don't think uh, it can get too much better than that. Like I said, this is one of those movies that just gets everything right. And if you if you have three hours to kill, this is the movie to do it with. <laughs> or one of the movies to do it with. So, cap things off. That's that with this episode. Like I said, I, like everyone else, am trying to adjust my life temporarily for, you know, all the craziness with the coronavirus. But like I said, keep chinning up and, you know, we'll get through this just fine. You know, there are... I know our country in particular is making progress every day. As much as it seems like things are only getting worse at times, you know, we are making progress every day. And we are going to we are gonna come out on top of this stronger than we ever did before. And before I get just too preachy, just remember to like, follow, and subscribe for Real Talk with Joe Aserno. Um, I hope, like I've said before, I hope I'm getting better <laughs> with being your host. I hope you're enjoying the show in general. And, uh... Yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have to say about that. So, until next time, I'm Joe Aserno. This has been Real Talk.